The first time I smoked weed got so high I hated it and even though at first I felt like I didn't want to do it again there was something about that experience that made me want to go back and try it again. I had this thought in my mind that could just kept telling me I could do it one more time and this time it would be different. I thought that my happiness would come from this relationship. I started stealing alcohol from my mom and she actually even at 14 had to lock up her cabinet. I didn't have a job, I didn't have a way to support my habits so I started stealing. And I started stealing my mom's checks and even my uncle's checks. I fell asleep and I woke up to the cops waking me up in bed and bringing me downstairs to arrest me for eight felony forgery charges. So George, you are a Vedic meditation teacher. You and I know each other fairly well. Um, we met in, in uh, Stratton, Vermont, at mm. that at that uh, what is it the Wonderlust retreat? Yeah. So, and and we've become colleagues. Um, you started teaching Vedic meditation, and so just just really quickly for the audience, people who don't know anything about different styles of meditation. How do you typically, if you were in an Uber and the Uber driver asked you about meditation and you only had one minute to go in the ride, how would you um, describe Vedic meditation? Yeah. So one of the ways I like to describe it is that there's really two main forms of meditation. There's one that's best suited for a monk which is the monastic approach to meditation. And then there's another that's best suited for what is called a householder, which essentially is a busy person with a busy life, an everyday person like me and you who still wants to experience meditation benefits but doesn't want to do all the things that monks do. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, is that when people like me and you try to practice a style of meditation that was best suited for a monk, our experiences are very difficult. And so Vedic meditation is more of a householder technique. And the way I describe it is, you know, if you had an ocean and there were all these waves on the surface, imagine those are like the 60 to 90,000 thoughts a day we have as a human being. Uh, if you did a cross section picture of the ocean, which if you don't know is a picture that looks at the top and bottom simultaneously, you would see that even when there's all these crazy waves on the surface of the ocean, if you went down far enough, deep enough in the ocean, you would see the ocean is still calm. And so the problem is, or the same is true for our mind. Underneath all those thoughts, there's calm, there's stillness, there's silence. The problem is most people just haven't been taught how to go from that busy surface, focused thinking zone of their mind where all the thoughts are down to that calm underneath. And so in Vedic meditation, that's what I teach my students how to do. Okay. Because everybody wants to experience the calmness, obviously, and uh, and they complain about the monkey mind. And I'm just bringing it up now at the very beginning of the episode, because in the last part of the episode, we're going to talk about this book that you wrote called Thrive, which is essentially a meditation and how to meditate uh, guide. And I'm assuming is to help people get to that uh, that calm place. But before we get into that, I would love to just unpack your backstory. So tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up and what was your mom into and where was your dad and who, where'd you grow up and who was in the house with you? Yeah. So I was born in California, uh, in San Diego, in, uh, Carlsbad, uh, Ancinitas area. And my dad actually was really, he was pretty bad, badly addicted to methamphetamine he was a bad alcoholic. And when I was born, my dad was actually uh, so messed up under the influence of drugs that he wasn't even able to drive my mom to the hospital. He actually had to uh, have his friend drive my mom to the hospital when she gave birth to me. And so I was born into a household where there was a lot of trauma. He broke my mom's nose multiple times while we were young. And he was physically and emotionally abusive to my mom. And eventually it got to the point where my mom had to move. And one night when he was asleep in the middle of the night, he, she packed up me and my sister and flew us to New Hampshire, where she was from, because she just couldn't continue to stay in that lifestyle anymore. And 
my mom, while I lived there though, the only sort of thing that gave her hope was she started reading Deepak Chopra's book called the seven spiritual laws of success. And then she, after reading that, learned that Deepak Chopra had a center for well-being actually in Carlsbad, which is the town that we were living in. So my mom would read that book and she would walk. It was uh, inside of the La Costa resort and spa. So she would go for walks with me in the stroller around the Chopra center and always tell herself that one day she was going to go there because it was that book was the only thing at that time that made her feel any hope because her, the situation that she was living in felt so hopeless for her. You also wrote in the book around 12, 13 years old, you started to dabble in drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I've, I've seen these studies where they have the twins who were the children of the alcoholic father. One never touches alcohol. The other one becomes uh, a drunk. And, um, and so it's really no prediction one way or the other um, if it's like a genetic thing or if it's a mindset thing. But talk a little bit about that, those first few experiences. How did you get introduced to it? Were you thinking about your dad wanting to emulate what your dad was doing? Or was that not even a part of the equation because he wasn't physically around at that point? And what were some of the... Um, I guess what you would consider to be upsides to drinking and alcohol as a, as a young person. My understanding of addiction now is that addiction is a response to trauma. And, you know, if you go back to the story that uh, I was just sharing about my mom and being in the hospital and, you know, I actually, when I was born, I was born with, uh, severe asthma and they actually didn't think that I was going to survive and the first uh, 11 days I was alive I had to be placed in the neonatal intensive care unit the NICU and my mom had didn't have insurance and so she had to make the very hard decision to not stay in the hospital with me for the first 11 days I was alive and so this sort of early deprivation of not having that love and attention that a child needs from their parent left this sort of void in my brain that I couldn't, I couldn't handle like that. I wasn't worthy and deserving of love, which later led me to really seek love and connection from my peers as I grew older. And this search for love and belonging that I feel like, you know, I always felt like I wasn't worthy and deserving of love, even from a very young age, which was rooted in this early trauma that I had just played a significant role, I believe now, in my addiction to drugs and alcohol, because I always felt like there was something missing. And, you know, I, I, I talked about this in my book, but Gabor Mate, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, who's one of the number one addiction and trauma specialists in the world, um, says that substances like heroin mimic the effects of endorphins providing that sense of love and connection that was missing during childhood. And so for me, uh, as soon as I picked up drugs and alcohol for the first time, it made me feel like it filled that void that I felt inside. And so for me, the way I explain it now is that for me, picking up drugs and alcohol the first time was the closest thing to a spiritual awakening that actually wasn't one for me. It made my life feel like it went from black and white to color. And like, you know, one of the things that I struggled with was social anxiety and being able to talk to women. And I remember when I picked up alcohol for the first time, it's like all of that melted away. And I felt like I could express myself uh, openly for the first time. But where were you specifically? You're 13 years old. Where are you drinking and doing all these drugs? Are you at your friend's house? Like, what, what, what's the scene like? Yeah, so I grew up skateboarding at the skate park. And I just, I was hanging out with these two kids I grew up with who were brothers. And they were my best friends. And they had an older brother. He must have been maybe 18. We were like 13. 
and we smoked weed with him for the first time. And I actually, the first time I smoked weed got so high, I hated it. I told myself that I would never do it again, but still it was like, there was something about it where again, it made me feel like my something changed. And even though at first I felt like I didn't want to do it again, there was something about that experience that made me want to go back and try it again. And then I ended up uh, going to the corner store with these two kids, these two brothers whose house I used to sleep over every Friday. I would go to the skate park and then go back to their house and sleep over. And we would, one of them suggested maybe we try to steal some alcohol. So we put all the alcohol inside of our pants, uh, inside of the belt, like underneath our pants in between our belt and our waist. And we drank. And I just remember just feeling that sense of ease and comfort, which came from taking that first drink. And then, you know, I started stealing alcohol from my mom and she actually, even at like 14 had to lock up the liquor cabinet. And my cousin actually, who's still struggling with addiction, he's homeless right now in California. He would fly to New Hampshire and he would always have with his family when they would come visit and he would always bring weed. And so I would start smoking weed and that's sort of how my journey with addiction began. Would your mom, I mean, obviously living with an addict and having kids with an addict, she would, she would see the signs and understand that that's what that was. Did she say anything to you early on when you were 12, 13, 14, when you would come back into the house thinking that you were able to conceal it all, but she would notice things? No, I think that my mom really wanted to believe that I wasn't doing those things. She wanted to ignore the signs. Like when we would take alcohol that, you know, it was only a one-off thing and it wouldn't happen again. That, you know, I didn't have a problem with addiction. I remember even not to jump too far ahead, but later on after I got addicted to heroin um, one time, she still would downplay it even after one time she walked into my room and saw me with a needle in both arms. So there was this part of her, I think, that really wanted to believe that I wasn't going down that path. How did you get addicted to heroin? Or was that just a slippery slope once you start the other, the weed and stuff and hanging out with a certain crowd? No. So what happened was, is again, it was like once I start, it was really you know, I started drinking. I was probably, I can't remember, 13, 14, seventh, eighth grade, and then ninth grade. And then I graduated when I was 17. So I think 14, I was a freshman in high school and I drank a lot that year. I was friends. I was pretty good at skateboarding. So I was friends with all the older skateboarder kids. And so I started just, you know, drinking and smoking weed with them on the weekends. But I, it was like, Two, I felt like included where, you know, I just, I didn't feel like I always was so worried about people's opinion of me. And I was so uh, scared that I didn't fit in. And, you know, I was so afraid to talk to women that the fact that, you know, I through partying and through drinking alcohol and smoking weed, I was being included in these uh, groups of people who I really looked up to. I started feeling like, yes, this is what's been missing in my life. Like I remember there was a kid at the skate park growing up who would give me, he was older and he, I actually ended up using heroin with him later on. He ended up uh, going to, he stole all these skateboards from the skate local skate shop and all these shoes. And he would show up to the skate park with a trunk full of shoes and skateboards. And he would give me new shoes and he would give me skateboards and I would actually go to the local skate shop because he worked there. That's where he was stealing this stuff. And he would he would put shoes in my backpack before I left so I could leave with a new pair of shoes. And so I started like really feeling like I was a part of something where I never felt a part of before that. And then in high school, like, you know, I was looked at as a pretty decent skateboarder. So this was in 10th grade when I got into heroin. I was friends with all the older kids. And then... What happened was I, there was this girl I was obsessed with. Like my, I thought that my happiness w would come from this relationship with this girl who was a senior. I was a sophomore and I knew her boyfriend cause he was a, 
he was a pretty big drug dealer at our high school. And I just wanted, she, I actually earlier that year, my sophomore year, I had thrown a party. My mom went away for the first time and she left me and my mom's boyfriend's son, the house. And he only wanted to invite a few people. But I remember by the end of uh, the school day on that Friday, I had invited like the entire school and she ended up coming to my house with her boyfriend and they stayed for the whole party and they had a good time. And then, so I had this sort of rapport with her and then I ended up in chemistry class with her because she like, I guess didn't complete that class earlier on and had to take it her senior year. And I had found out that she wanted to go to a Britney Spears concert. And it just so happened that my sister had tickets to that concert, but she couldn't go. She got sick. And so my mom said, oh, I don't know what to do with these tickets. I was like, I'll take those. And then I asked her uh, if she would go. And she said, yes. And if, I remember a few days before that concert, she said, I was in, I can see it as clear as day. I was in the cafeteria at my high school. And she said, Hey, I want to ask you something. And she pulled me to the side in the cafeteria. And I said, yeah, what's going on? And she said, Hey, do you think you'd ever try heroin for the first time when we go to that concert? And I had heard all these things in their class about how bad heroin was for you. But I perceived it because of what I had heard is like only people who live under a bridge do that or only like, you know, people who are homeless would be addicted to something like heroin. And here this was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen in my entire life standing in front of me asking me if I'd ever try heroin for the first time. And I was scared because I thought I had to use needles. But she said, so I told her that and she said, no, you can just sniff it. And so I went to that concert and uh, I we didn't do it before and her and her boyfriend picked us up afterwards. And what happened was her boyfriend had his best friend in the front seat and they took out a CD case and they broke out the lines of heroin and they passed it around and they all did it first. And then it got to me and I was sitting behind the passenger seat and her boyfriend's best friend turned around and said, Hey, he could tell how young I was. I was 15 years old and you know, my name's George, but my middle name is Spike. So I never went by George ever until I got sober. So everybody called me Spike. So I always say the only reason that they were okay with this little kid being in the car with them doing heroin was because probably because my name was Spike. And so he said that and I was like, don't worry. Like I got this because I want to do anything I could to impress this girl. Wait, what did he say and, to you though? Oh, he said, Hey, I don't know if you know what you're getting yourself into. And I said, don't worry, I got this. And he was like, you know, he could tell how young I was and realized the path that I was about to go down. He had already been in and out of rehab. He was like 20 years old at the time, multiple times. And fast forward, not to get it too ahead, but that same kid ended up, he's, I'm 13 years sober now. He's 16 years sober. And when I got sober this time, he was the person I called who helped me get back on my path of recovery. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Okay, so then you become a full-blown intravenous using heroin addict. So just, just describe one of your most rock bottom moments at this stage in your addiction. Yeah, so as my addiction continued to progress, you know, I didn't have a job, I didn't have a way to support my habit, so I started stealing. And I started stealing my mom's checks and even my uncle's checks and I would forge them in order to get money from the bank. And they had caught me uh, a few years before this, but had told me like, Hey, if it ever happens again, we're going to press charges. And then later on, I started doing it again, just to my mom. Cause I knew my mom didn't really check her, uh, her bank balance every day. I knew she didn't really look at see what check was the last one she had written. So I started writing these bad checks and I ended up after I think the eighth bad check that I wrote my or the seventh, my mom 
uh, looked in her checkbook, realized there was all this money missing, and she went to the bank to figure out what was going on, and they were able to see that I had been cashing all these checks. And she talked to the bank, and the bank really wanted to press charges because this is the second time that this had happened. And I said, I mean, and my mom said, no, let me talk to him. If he does it one more time, we'll press charges. And so uh, what happened was is I, my mom came home. She talked to me. She told me if this happens again, the bank's going to press charges. Each one of these uh, checks is going to be a felony charge. So, you you know, make sure you don't do this again. You're lucky you were able to get out of it this time. And I remember, you know, the way I understand addiction now is that, you know, part of it is, you know, when we get sober, that inner turmoil we feel causes this persistent and reoccurring thought that's like stronger than and doesn't respond to reason. Meaning like I had this thought in my mind that could just kept telling me I could do it one more time and this time it would be different. And so my, my I needed to get high and I didn't know how. And I was with a friend of mine. And I said, I bet you if I go to a different branch of the bank that they won't catch me. So I went to a different bank branch and I brought another check and I went to cash it and they were taking way too long. And intuitively I knew that I was about to get in trouble and they had my ID. They had the check and I just took off running. And then I went on the run for like three or four days. And eventually I just knew I was going to have to turn myself in and I came back to my house and my I'd been missing from my house for days and it was morning. I snuck in before my mom had woken up and I went up to my bedroom and lay down because I really hadn't slept in like four days. Where were you when you were on the run? I had actually broken into my uncle's house because he lived in New York and he had bought in my grandfather's house in New Hampshire, but he wasn't staying there. So I snuck in, I broke in, I started staying there. And then after four days or so, I knew that I couldn't keep going like this. And if I got caught at his house, I knew I'd be in, I'd be in even more trouble. And then I came up, I laid down to try to get some rest. And my mom must've heard me snuck in. She called the cops and I fell asleep and I woke up to the cops waking me up in bed and bringing me downstairs to arrest me for eight felony forgery charges. Hmm. Wow. That sounds very dramatic. <laughs> and were you, were you high at the time that you got arrested? I wasn't. I Just wasn't tired. Tired. Yeah. I had okay. ran out of drugs pretty quickly. Okay. So how were you getting money for drugs? Were you having to do all kinds of dignity compromising things? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how I lived my life is like, you know, I stole from my mom. I used to, I used to steal from people all the time who, you know, would try to buy drugs or somebody would come and they'd want mushrooms. I remember some kid came, he wanted mushrooms and he paid me 500 bucks. He brought me to the spot where I was supposed to get a mushrooms. And I went in the building and I went out the other side of the building and I never came back. And so this is pretty much how you know, I lived my life. Everything, everything was a lie. Like even, you know, like I just wanted people to like me so bad. I remember I would tell people like I, I grew up listening to hip hop and I would listen to some underground artists who lots of people didn't know about. And I would show my, I would show these kids who I was using with some of these artists and I would tell them it was my cousin because they didn't know who, you know, they were. And I, I would just lie and I'd cheat and I'd steal and I just did whatever I could to get high because it was the only way that I knew. And, you know, I couldn't go a day without using. What was the budget that you needed to continue getting high every day? How much did you spend? Well, it depends because I went through a period, too, where my dad. So my dad, who I talked about, he passed away. He had cirrhosis of the liver and he died from uh cirrhosis of the liver from drinking but also when he had been in vietnam he had also been addicted to heroin and so my dad uh passed away and when he passed away he left me i think like ten thousand dollars so there was a period of time in there where i my mom always told me i could never access that money till i was 18 but one day when i was desperate i decided to just go to the savings bank where it was and ask them you know uh 
hey, can I make a withdrawal on this? And then if they said, no, you have to be 18, I would have just said, sorry. But they said, yeah, no problem. And I ended up taking out like a couple hundred dollars. And so for a while, I was using that $10,000 that my father had less left me when he passed away. But my the average amount usually when I didn't have access to that type of money was I needed like at least usually $100 a day to get high. Wow. You were spending a hundred dollars a day to get high, so th- three thousand a month, average. Yeah, and you had the same connection, same drug dealer going to get the heroin. Yeah, for the most part, it was for the most part. It was that girl, girl's boyfriend. Like he ended up becoming my drug dealer, and in they they would go down to Massachusetts because like oh, opiates in New England are really bad. Like people are like so many young people in the new England area, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine uh, have really struggled with opiate addiction. And so they would all go down to Massachusetts and they would, we would go down there every day. We would, we would get the money. And the way it worked was there'd be the drug dealer down there. It was like a business, right? They had the, most of the drug dealers that we were buying from down there, who the guys who were the connections, they had never done drugs in their life. They were doing it for a business and they would have strict hours, just like a real business. You had to be there by seven o'clock. So some days I'd be two hours away in New Hampshire and need to get high, but we wouldn't get the hundred dollars till five, five thirty, And we'd be flying down there. We'd be, there'd be traffic. We'd be in the breakdown lanes flying down there just to make sure that we could get there by seven o'clock in order to get the drugs we needed. Okay, so you have eight felony charges after getting arrested. What happens? Do you go to jail? Do you get released and and assigned to recovery program? Yeah, so I was lucky. I'd never been in trouble before. I'd never been arrested for anything except for once I stole as a kid when I was like 13 years old from a convenience store. But I had gotten, they had made me just do community service for that because I was so young. And so luckily I was able, my mom, once what she said to me when I got arrested was, if you go to treatment, I'll drop the charges. So I went to treatment. I thought she was going to drop the charges. She tried and the state of New Hampshire said, no, we're picking up the charges. And so, which I didn't even know they could do. So the charges got picked up by the state. So she hired a lawyer because I decided to go to treatment for me. And the lawyer ended up getting me, uh, because it was my first time ever getting arrested on this program for like first time offenders under the age of 25 called the diversion program. And what it pretty much was, was long-term probation. Uh, it was like a two year plus program, 500 hours of community service. You had to get drug tested every week. And if you completed the program, your charges would get dropped. And I knew that if I used that I would have to go back to court for my charges, but I still couldn't stay sober. And there were multiple times on there where I used, and I got in trouble, but I had this like angel of a probation officer who would, instead of sending me back to court to face my charges, she let me go to treatment. And so there were multiple times during that stint of two years of probation that I had to do where I ended up going to treatment. And those were my first run-ins with recovery and the first time I'd ever put together any sort of sobriety time. Yeah. So I think one of the the caricaturizations of a drug addict, you know, if you pass by someone on the street and you've never touched drugs and you see them, they look strung out. Maybe all oh, this person is just always thinking about drugs, using drugs, but give us a realistic portrayal. What is it actually like when you are an addict? Are you wanting to be an addict or in those those few moments of sobriety, are you thinking, man, I need to get off of this stuff. And then your body would sort of go into autopilot and take over and make you crave and fiend for these drugs. And then you'd go through the whole crash again. And then, you know, the one moment of hope you'd get out and go, Oh my God, I need to get out. And like, how does it, how does it actually feel? Yeah. You know, you know, I didn't want to be using, right. There were multiple times where I wanted to, I wanted to kill myself because I just, I wanted to stay sober. An example is, you know, my mom told me once that 
her and my sister who I loved more than anybody in the world wouldn't be able to talk to me if I kept drinking, if I kept using. And when I told my mom that I really didn't want to drink, like I meant it. And if you hooked me up to a lie detector test, like I would have passed, but I just could not stay sober because, you know, I remember too, my, uh, I had this great uncle who was much older. He didn't, understand addiction i remember he would come to my house and he would see the pain that was causing my mom and he'd always say why can't you just get your act together and you know well-meaning people told me all the time you know you just need to get your act together you need to quit drugs you need to stop drinking but what you know obviously i didn't have the language for it at the time but you know what i wasn't addressing was the deeper trauma that was driving my addiction um and so what would happen was is I would get sober. I would swear. I would, you know, usually because something bad would happen, I'd swear off drugs and alcohol. Again, if you hooked me up to a lie detector test, I would have passed. But, you know, after 30, 60, 90 days dealing with that, um, you know, inner turmoil that I would feel, eventually the only thing I knew that could provide me from with a little bit of temporary relief from the discomfort I felt inside was to go and use again. And so my life because of this would just, just sort of became one more attempt at using followed by one more failure at using followed by one more attempt at sobriety followed by one more attempt at using followed by one more failure at using sort of over and over and over again, because I wanted to stop, but I just couldn't because eventually the pain I felt inside was just too strong. And I, I just didn't know any other way to deal with it. All right. So let's talk about this sober camp out and your mom's MP3 player and how that all kind of led to your introduction to uh, meditation. Yeah. So, you know, I had tried to get sober a million times and really I just was so uncomfortable in my own skin that I would always say I was bored. And so I was, I would always look for any opportunity to do something because I couldn't sit with myself by myself and be okay. And I remember, you know, in different uh, recovery support groups, they, they do different outings and there was this sobriety camp out that was going on. I got invited to, and I remember while I was there, there was, uh, there were a lot of like girls there who I thought were cute and, these cooler, older kids who I wanted to talk with, but I felt so much social anxiety. I just felt like, you know, the entire time I was near anybody, I was just in my head worried about what people thought about me the whole time. And so I, at the sober camp out, just at one point, that feeling of social anxiety, I had just, it became so overwhelming I don't know where it came from. It was almost out of nowhere. I thought I have to do something. And then I remembered that this MP3 player that I happened to take with me on the sober camp out that my, I, you know, I would take it to listen to music. My mom had these guided meditations that she used to tell me about that she used to try to get me to do, but I was never interested in. So I decided like being sober, you know, hearing other people in recovery, talk about meditation that I would give one of these things a try. And I didn't really know what I was supposed to be doing or if it was working or not. But for some reason, it was a it was a guided meditation by a guy named David G. And pretty much he was just suggesting that, you know, we repeat these affirmations. And for some reason, I associated with meditation with breathing. And so I started just breathing really, really fast while saying these affirmations. And now I teach breath work and I can see that the style of breathing that I was doing was similar to actually the breath work technique that I teach now. Mm -hmm. And I was just breathing really fast in and out of my mouth. And what started to happen is my whole body, like my feet and my hands and my whole body started almost like tingling, like my foot fell asleep. And I remember for the first time, like I felt good in my own skin without drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so as you know, you know, that feeling is something that stuck with me later on, you know, through my other attempts at trying to get sober that then led me back to being willing to try meditation again. 
And then you went another almost three months, fell off the wagon, and then did a 21-day challenge with your friend, the one you were talking about earlier. And that was what it caused it to finally click? Yes. Yeah, so actually, after that, I went to uh, Delray Beach, Florida to try to get sober. I, they, my, I had relapsed again. My family sent me to treatment in Louisiana for two months. I went from there to a sober house down in Florida. And there I met a guy who tried, who had been doing Deepak Chopra and Oprah's 21 day guided meditation series. Mm -hmm. And when, and when I did that, I started to feel just like, I didn't really know again what was supposed to be happening or what I was supposed to be doing, but I did start to feel like a subtle sense of peace. And it was, and I think at times too, I also went back do, during that 21 day guided meditation, did that original guided meditation that I had done on that camp out with the breathing. And that would always bring back that feeling, right? Where it felt like the, my, my whole body was filled with energy. And it was the only time again, I ever felt good in my own skin without drugs and alcohol. And so this time, uh, you know, I started feeling that feeling again and I actually again ended up relapsing. But then when I was, but that feeling stuck with me and then I moved to Boston because I, I wasn't happy in Florida. I was trying to do the geographical cure. I thought where I was living was the problem again. And I moved to Boston and I was 89 days sober and I wasn't meditating during that time. But I moved to Boston. I had uh, I went to a free concert. Somebody gave me, uh, handed me a Red Bull with whiskey. And that voice in my ego was so loud that it told me that if I, if I didn't take a sip, what would she think about me? And so I, I pretended to take a sip. I put the Red Bull up to my mouth, but I kept my lips closed. And then my ego told me, she saw you pretend now you got to take a real sip. And I was 89 days sober and I took a real sip and I instantly felt dead on the inside like I had just come off a month long heroin binge and I got to that place where I knew I was going to, I had this like voice loud and clear come into my head and say, you're going to keep going on the way you're going and die, or you're going to get some help. And that's when I called my best friend, um, one of my best friends, that guy who was in the car with me that first time I ever did heroin. He had been sober like three years at that time. And I just said, I'm ready to do it somebody else's way. And then eventually when I got sober this time, I started back up with the meditation again because I remembered that feeling. And that's one of the um, tenets of the, of the recovery community, right? Like people try to do it their way using the same thinking that got them into the bind in the first place. And then they just say, just start following the steps. You're not going to agree with all the steps. You may think you can skip steps, but... You just follow the steps without questioning them. And that is the gateway to uh, to being able to get this thing under control. Yeah, and that's exactly what I hadn't been doing, right? I had been trying to do it George's way, and I've been trying to pick and choose what steps I was willing to do. And this time when I got sober, it was like, you know, one of the things I was never willing to do was just to be honest about all those things I told myself that I had that I would never tell anybody. I had some things I, you know, they talk about them in recovery. It's like those, uh, take it to the grave mm -hmm. things that you're carrying around. And for me, a lot of those had to do with like different sexual abuse trauma that I had had as a kid growing up. And I was really, a, all of the biggest things I was scared to talk about for me had to do with sex and, uh, you know, things that had happened to me when I was young as a child, with friends that had made me feel uncomfortable that I felt really ashamed about. And I had sort of alluded to those things in the past to my sober mentors when I had attempted to get sober, but I had never just been completely honest and been transparent with somebody else and told them all those things. I told myself that I would never tell anybody. And this time, you know, I got honest, I was willing to go to any lengths. And another big part of that, thing I was trying to pick and choose before that this time I became willing to do was, you know, was make my amends and to make a better last impression than first impression that I had made on the people that I had hurt. And I was afraid because I was afraid of the consequences of going back and having to uh, amend my behavior from the past. And this time 
I just knew it's like I had tried it my way and it didn't work. And I knew I was probably going to die if I kept using. And so I just said, you know what? especially with the being honest about the things that had happened in my past, you know, one of the principles that I heard somebody say this at a recovery meeting and it it really changed everything for me. They said, uh, you can't save your ass and your face at the same time. You know, I was so scared of what people thought about me that I didn't ever want to get honest. And this time I was like, you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks about me or if they judge me, this is a life or death errand for me. And you went back to some of those stores where you stole from, right? And, and fessed up and paid them. Yeah, I went back to everyone. I went back to every store. I even went back to drug dealers I had stole from. Uh, you know, and still, the only people I haven't made amends to are people who I don't know how to get in touch with mm-hmm. or people who aren't willing to, you know, talk to me anymore. And I recently actually had an experience where I was in uh, the local co op and somebody. The reason I know it's somebody from my past is because they still call me Spike. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm standing in line for the bathroom, and somebody goes, is that Spike? And I was like, I turned around. I looked. I had no idea who this person was. And they had just totally changed since high school, and it's somebody who I had robbed while I was in high school. And right away, I just walked right up, told them, hey, look, you know, I want to I want to, you know, be honest that, you know, it was wrong of me to cause harm to you in this way in the past. And actually, I'd love to right now while I'm checking out, go and get cash back and pay you back that money that I stole from you. And it's like I used to walk around the town I lived in with my hood up because I was afraid of getting beat up because I wanted everybody to think I was tough, but I wasn't. I was so scared of getting hurt and getting into fights and altercations. People would come to my house who I stole and my mom would have to pay them back for me so I wouldn't get beat up. And now it was like being able to make my amends. It freed me right from that burden of the past. And I no longer had to walk around with my hood up anymore. And it was like such a feeling of liberation to be free from having to walk around with my head down, afraid of running into somebody who I had stole from or who I had caused harm to. Any bizarre or unusual reactions when you showed back up at someone's place and, and tried to pay them back and ask for forgiveness? Uh, No, but actually one story I like to tell whenever I think about making amends is how there were multiple people, though, who I in my head had made it out into this huge story about the pain and harm that I had caused these people. And then I went back and they didn't even remember what I had done. And they're like, oh, I didn't even remember that you did that. But like, thanks for being honest. Like, I'm glad you're sober. And it just helped me realize like how much like I thought people were spending their time thinking about me and then it just put it into reality how little people were actually thinking about me and how much more they were probably worried about the things that were going on in their own life right now are you a trader joe's at this point yeah so i got sober in 2011 in august 7th of 2011 and then in september probably about a month later I started working at Trader Joe's. And so throughout the process of making amends for the first 10 years, pretty much I was sober. I worked at Trader Joe's. I, I, ironically, I taught a guy meditation who was managing a Trader Joe's somewhere in LA or in South, I'm sorry, in Orange County. And uh, it seems like Trader Joe's has turned out more meditation teachers than any other Grocery store chain. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you also met well, Sydney at Trader Joe's as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. And I actually, just to confirm that point, I ended up teaching so many people after becoming a meditation teacher, including managers, how to meditate at Trader Joe's. So it was really an amazing place for me to have the opportunity to work during those first 10 years. I was sober. And yeah, after I got sober, I was like, Four months into working there, Sydney, my wife, had started working there a month after I had. And I was, you know, I one of my best friends. I had gotten a job there, and me and him used to hang out in the grocery store at night. We'd work the night shift, 3.30 to midnight. And after we'd close, we'd be checking out all the girls in the store, hoping. Because, I, you know, while I was using, when you're using opiates, like, for me, like, I wasn't even concerned about being in a relationship. Um, and so when I got sober, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to find a girlfriend and then eventually I met 
the person who's now my wife just we started dating in December of 2011 me and Sydney started dating which was only like four months after I got sober and every other time I tried to get sober I got a lot of times what took me out was getting into a relationship putting that relationship in front of my recovery but luckily at this point four months into my sobriety I had sort of been treating it at that point like again a life or death Aaron so for me I had I knew in my mind that if I put the relationship before my recovery, I was going to lose that in my recovery. So luckily, you know, I, I was still prioritizing my inner work and my sobriety over my relationship, but you know, we were able to make both of those things work together. Mm. Okay. And you told a story in your book about how an argument that you got into with Sydney helped you to see that actually the meditation you had been doing really works. And I think this is, I think that's really, um, relevant for a lot of people listening to this and maybe thinking about meditation or maybe dabbling in meditation. What was your, what was that experience? Yeah, I had gotten into an argument cause I was still very codependent in the beginning of my relationship. Mm -hmm. And so when one day Sydney, when we first started dating, decided to go out with some friends at Trader Joe's in the evening and she didn't really tell me what they were doing and she went out and I felt like, you know, she should have told me is the attitude I had. And so I got upset with her and she, uh, when she came home, I was like, why didn't you tell me? Uh, when she got home that evening, I called her and asked her why she didn't tell me. And she said, you know, like, look, I just started dating. Like, I don't have to tell you, I don't have to like, tell you if I'm hanging out with another guy like you know we're not exclusive like that at least at this point and so you know she said like I'm not sure if I really want to continue on with this relationship like you seem like you have some problems with codependency and you're very controlling and so for me I was like devastated and in the past like every other time I had felt like that I found it as a good excuse to go and use again and you know, one of the things that I've learned was meditation helped me get to more of a place of what I now call self-referral happiness, where like I had this internal state of happiness that was independent of external circumstances. And so it was like I was able to be OK enough to be OK and know that I was going to be OK and didn't have to use even if Sydney decided that she was going to leave me because of my behavior. You uh, then take a series of trainings, many of which you get scholarships for, because now you're sharing your story. Who would have thought that all that craziness you went through would be uh, instrumental in helping you <laughs> learn these practices, these spiritual practices that you then go on to teach later? And then um, you and I cross paths in in. Stratton, I guess you had read my book, Bliss More, and then you came and, and assisted me with some stuff and ended up taking a Vedic meditation teacher training with a guy named Tim Brown. Um, so can you give us an idea of how you transitioned from just being a practitioner of yoga and meditation to, to recognizing that you want to become a teacher. You want to help other people. What was that transition like? What was happening on the inside? What was happening on the outside? Because I know that you got a lot of scholarships and you were using your story at this point. And this is the great thing about AA, you know, in recovery programs is that you really, you, you get very practiced in telling your story and telling it in such a way that people really connect with it, which I think is, you know, Jeff Kober, he does a great job telling a story. Rich Roll does a great job telling a story. All these guys that I know who are in recovery, they they know they have their story down. It's like they're a stand-up comedian. They know all the, <laughs> the you know the good bits, the funny bits, the interesting bits. And it sounds like you were able to do this as well and then use it to inspire people to want to help you. Yeah. So that first retreat that I went on where I learned to meditate. I just knew that, you know, the training was four sessions that they used to teach us to meditate. And in the second session of that training, it was like probably the clearest thought I can ever remember. Uh, 
or the clearest uh, run in with my intuition I can ever remember of this voice I had being just so loud and clear that I couldn't even ignore it where something inside me just said, you have to learn how to teach this because, you know, for the first time I, you know, the, my biggest problem was this nonstop incessant activity in my mind that just felt like it would never shut off. And that's why I used opiates because like it temporarily paused that noise that was always going on in my head. And when I learned to meditate, it was like on that second day of the training, I had this experience where I transcended, which means to go beyond, like I went beyond that, right? And I accessed what I like to call now, like my own inner reservoir of bliss inside. And for me, it was just like, it was such a profound experience that right after I came out of the meditation at the end of that session, I just heard this voice inside say that, you have to learn how to teach this because this is like what I'd been looking for in drugs and alcohol my whole life. And I knew that if it had such a profound impact on me, I knew it could definitely have a profound impact on other people who were having that same experience that I was having. So you've been teaching for a while now and you recently published, well, you had your podcast global shift and that's been going on for how many years now? It's been going on for about three or four years, but in the last two years is when uh, I became more serious and started consistently putting out a new episode each week. Right. And you've got a, um, you've got your newsletter, which is George's Daily Motivation. And most recently you have a book out called Thrive. And you still continued to work at Trader Joe's for a while, and then eventually you took the leap of faith away from that and into teaching full time. So just talk a little bit about that process, the thought process that you um, you navigated, you know, because I'm sure the idea of leaving steady income to become a meditation teacher was a scary one. And how did you know it was the right time? Again, because I think people listening to this probably, maybe they teach yoga, maybe they teach meditation now, maybe they're thinking of becoming a Reiki instructor or something or a practitioner, and yet they have a job working in you know, a very traditional nine to five environment. And the thought of leaving that and going to something that is a little bit more uncertain is very scary for people. So what was your process like? How did you overcome your fear? And uh, especially because you're married, you have a family, you know, that you have to take care of, you had a house and all this stuff. So what, what was your experience? Yeah, you know, it's something that I wanted to do for years when I worked at Trader Joe's. You know, I knew that eventually I wanted to leave to teach meditation full time. But, uh -huh. you know, I I was in a comfortable enough situation there. And, you know, I had also learned that I didn't need to necessarily leave. I still had, I luckily worked a 4 a.m. to noon shift. And so I was able to get out at noon and work on my business. Uh, Trader Joe's was really flexible and they would give us, they would give me and Sydney plenty of time off to go like leave for a month at a time to go host a retreat somewhere around the country. And so for a while it was pretty comfortable and I knew I eventually I wanted to leave, but because I owned a house and like you said, I had a wife, like it just didn't feel like it was the right time. I was, I was letting it at that point be a venture capitalist for my dream job. And then, you know, it just got to the point. What happened was it was almost like it was, I was forced out. It was, it was the time when it was just like the universe knew it was the time. And luckily I could hear the voice of my intuition that knew that was the case. What happened was, we had actually, me and Sydney were, we owned a two family home in Rhode Island. It was a multifamily. So luckily we were able, we were able to buy that from working at Trader Joe's and we had a tenant. So we were able to make money off renting one of the units, which was helping bring in some more income to pay our mortgage. But then we decided in the 2021, uh, in October, that we wanted to move to the woods because of everything that was happening with the pandemic. And we wanted to be somewhere that wasn't in a city. So we also had been hosting retreats 
locally and obviously our destination retreats around the world. So we wanted a place maybe where we would be able to host retreats locally. And so what happened was, is we just started looking for a home in New Hampshire. And our plan was we decided, Hey, we'll move to New Hampshire. We'll buy this home to host retreats. Once the business starts going well in New Hampshire and we get established up there, then we'll leave Trader Joe's. But in the meantime, we'll transfer to the Trader Joe's up here. So that was the plan. And we we found the house. It was a long process to get the house because the woman who had owned the house passed away and it went into probate court. We almost didn't think we were going to get the house. And then last minute we got it. And we we're supposed to transfer to the Trader Joe's in New Hampshire. But there the Trader Joe's recently had just changed the rule that depending on the minimum wage in the state that you're transferring to, they can adjust your pay rate. And when I started at Trader Joe's, I had no good work history. I was only making $10 an hour because I had never really held a job when I was using. And I worked my way all the way up to $25. And Sydney was uh, probably close to $30 an hour at that time. And they were trying to adjust our pay because the minimum wage in New Hampshire was much different than in Massachusetts where we were working. And so it took about three weeks for us to go back and forth with them to get them to keep our pay at the same rate. And luckily the manager who we're super grateful for really fought hard for us to be able to keep our pay. And in the end they said, you guys can keep your pay. But at that point I remember I'm, I meditated and I just remember a thought clear as day coming into my awareness after I came out of my meditation that said, look, you've already been off Trader Joe's for three weeks. It's not going to ever be easy to take the leap. So you might as well just do it now. And I was, I felt very ready, but I was scared that Sydney wasn't going to want or wasn't prepared for us to leave and go all in on teaching at that point. But I went and I talked to her and she said that she was all in. And then uh, we just decided it, that that was the time. It was never going to get any easier and that we should just go for it at that point. Right. Because she's a chef. So she also had an aspiration to do something other than work at Trader Joe's, right? Oh, yeah, most definitely. And she's an artist and she just... She, you know, she'd been working there like myself for 10 years and at that point was just ready, even though it was scary. And at that point, it was particularly scary because we still hadn't sold our home in Rhode Island. We're living in New Hampshire, so we had two mortgages, you know, and even still sometimes we don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage. But, you know, I keep prioritizing my own inner work and, you right. know, following my path. And, you know, at the end of the month, our needs always get met. I imagine combined, you were making well in the six figures working at Trader Joe's, right? Yeah. So that's a big, that's a big lift, <laughs> you know, hoping that people come to learn how to meditate because you don't, obviously don't want to bring that desperation into the teaching, right? Because people can sense that. But I know from my own experience, because I was in a similar situation, you get to the point where you just have to trust what that inner guidance is telling you to do. And it's like, you can't halfway trust it. You either trust it all the way or you just keep doing the conventional thing. Was that your experience as well? Yeah, that's exactly what my experience was is, you know, it was like to my intellect, it didn't make any sense to leave Trader Joe's. I didn't know how we were going to pay the mortgages each month, but I also, you know, had, followed it enough to know that even when it doesn't make sense how it's all work gonna work out if i follow it uh i'm going to find myself in the right place at the right time more often and things are going to almost always tend to work out for me and you know that's been my experience this whole time you know and still even to this day following it and you know taking the leap even though it's scary and you don't know how it's going to turn out so is that the same guidance that led you to start your newsletter, your daily newsletter, which is also a big lift, as well as to start your podcast, as well as to start this idea of writing a book? Yeah, exactly. I remember with the podcast, uh, you know, I got this idea to start a podcast. And then one day I was uh, at Trader Joe's and the thought just the guidance just 
came through and said, call it global shift podcast. And then I had this like awareness that those are my initials, George Spike Peterson. And then I knew when I got that name that I was supposed to start the podcast. And then with my daily newsletter, it was the same thing. One day that inner guide has just told me, you know, I was doing it weekly. And then, you know, I had listened to actually a podcast with yourself and Jeff Kober, who you've mentioned, and you guys talked about making the newsletter daily. And I remember just hearing my inner guidance say that, you know, you got to make it daily. And I, you know, I didn't know how I would do that, but I knew to follow it because I'd been practicing following it my whole sobriety. And, you know, that's really what for me, I believe sobriety is about shifting from primarily sourcing what's right for me externally to learning to primarily source what's right for me internally from that inner guidance. And it's the same thing that, you know, led me to start the book and, uh, you know, is, is what guided me to, I remember there were multiple times writing, have this experience where, you know, it was like I was writing and I would just keep typing. And it was like, I was watching myself type, but not knowing where the words were coming from. What about skateboarding? How did that skill or learning that skill come into play later on? Um, I imagine maybe it taught you process or, or I've never really been a skateboarder, so I don't know what it takes to find that flow, but talk, talk a little bit about that connection. Yeah, I never really thought about it, but now that you say it, the first thing that came to me was, I think what it taught me is perseverance and uh, you know, with skateboarding, like when you're learning a new trick, it you know, you have to really keep getting up and trying it again. And every time that, you know, you fall down, you got to get back up, you got to keep going. And, you know, for me, that's been a lot of what this journey has been about for me is just learning how to, you know, even when, you know, I fall short or things don't work out the way that I intended just keep trusting that inner guidance and, you know, keep taking action in the direction of my dreams. Beautiful. Okay. In your book, Thrive, you introduced the world to the MEDI technique, M-E-D-I, the MEDI technique. That's an acronym. What does it stand for? Yeah. So the acronym MEDI is an acronym that I came up with uh, as a way to help make meditation more easy and enjoyable for people. Uh, the M in the acronym stands for meditate effortlessly. The E stands for expect your mind to wonder. The D stands for detach. And the I stands for integrate. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback. And back to the show. Okay. Now at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned um, that you're Vedic meditation teacher and the difference is you get to that calm place down at the bottom of the ocean. So is that what this is meant to do, the Medi technique, or what's the purpose of this particular approach to meditation? Yeah. So, you know, one of my motivations behind writing this book was to provide access to those who couldn't afford to sit down with someone like me for four days to become a self-sufficient daily meditator. Uh, you know, in these principle, the principles in the book, which are inspired by what I teach in Va my Vedic meditation training, apply to everyone, no matter where they are. And I wanted to share this knowledge so that people could benefit from it, you know, who, again, might not be able to come meditate, learn to meditate with me in person. You know, and while obviously I know, like, th there's a reason that I wrote the book, I also understand that the book, you know, can't replace the importance of that teacher student relationship. Um, but, you know, for me, it was like I had been to numerous sobriety support groups and I, you know, had overheard people's frustration with meditation and not everybody was willing to invest the time or money it would take to come learn to meditate again with somebody like me. So I wanted to create a book for those people, you know, that could not only, um, 
help them learn to meditate, but also help them break free from the things that were holding them back. Okay. And if we were to take each one, M-E-D-I, and break it down a little bit, what does it mean to meditate effortlessly? Yeah, so the M, meditate effortlessly. One of the points that I emphasize in this section of the book is that you don't have to sit in an uncomfortable position during meditation. You know, when you meditate, you know, lots of people, like if we were to Google meditation right now, you would see somebody with their back perfectly straight and their fingers touching, even though they have no idea why their fingers are touching together like this and they'd have no back support. But, um, you know, I suggest in the book that those are more styles of meditation that are best suited for monks and instead to try to sit what I call effortlessly or comfortably with back support during your meditation. And, you know, another part of meditating effortlessly is in the book. I have people use a mantra and there's a lot of different things that are, you know, considered a mantra nowadays, but this is a word that I give to people in the book that's supposed to specifically help their mind start settling. And, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I, I speak about in the book is that, you know, you never have to try to use effort to quiet your mind, right? Uh, if you try to make your mind more quiet, you're actually going to get the opposite of a quiet mind, which is a busy mind, right? And so the idea is you can't stop your thoughts, but you can learn to transcend them, go beyond them and experience a more settled mind. And so I teach people a more effortless approach through sitting comfortably and taking an effortless approach using the mantra in order to go beyond and experience, you know, more calm and more quiet and the benefits of meditation in the practice. Okay. And then what about expecting the mind, expecting the mind to wander? What, what is that? What does that mean? Yeah. So before I left, that nine to five job at Trader Joe's to teach meditation full time. I often found myself talking to customers at Trader Joe's about meditation. And almost every time they'd tell me they couldn't meditate because their mind was too busy. They, you know, they often said that term, they had a monkey mind. And what I talk about in expecting your mind to wonder is it's not actually their busy mind or the monkey mind that is the real problem. Uh, the real problem, I suggest, is more like having what I call a cluttered attic. And so I say like, a, you know, this idea that like, imagine your body as an attic that's been storing years of stress and trauma, and it's packed away like old boxes and forgotten items would be in an attic. And when you sit down and meditate, it's like you're opening that attic door. And at first, you know, you're faced with that mess inside. So you probably spent years trying to ignore it or fight against your thoughts during meditation, just like you might try to close the door on the mess you don't want to deal with. And as you meditate and your body starts to receive deep rest, it triggers this natural cleanup process. And the process is like dusting off old memories and feelings and stirring up sensations and emotions related to that past stress. And just like cleaning out a cluttered attic stirs up dust, this internal cleanup can also make your mind more active, especially initially during meditation. So instead of trying to stop your thoughts in meditation, I suggest that you try to embrace and surrender to your wandering mind. And as you continue to clear out this old stress, and triggers in your body the real benefit of the meditation is they start to lose their power and you know i think that you know we often overlook that this benefit which is like the real benefit of meditation by focusing so much on the amount of thoughts we're having during meditation as opposed to the fact that once you release that stress from your body you can experience or you can encounter those same triggers that once really used to set you off and now you no longer react to them anymore. Okay. And, and detach, what are we detaching from? 
most of us, again, have been conditioned to think that if we have thoughts during meditation that we failed. And so the detach in this technique encourages you to detach and surrender to whatever's happening during your meditation, including your wandering mind and the other experiences that you might be tempted to resist during your meditation. You know, one of your previous podcast guests and my teachers, Emily Fletcher, says, you know, the mind thinks involuntarily like the heart beats involuntarily. So trying to give our mind a command to stop thinking is like trying to give our heart a command to stop beating. So I suggest that, you know, you detach and you surrender to whatever's happening during your meditation and from rushing, right, when you realize that your mind has wandered off to get back to the practice and instead learning to be more gentle with yourself during the meditation. Okay. And then finally, I is for integrate, integrating slowly back into activity. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I talk about how, you know, our body starts receiving higher quality rest when we start meditating. And so getting up abruptly from our meditation is like, is like getting up from a deep sleep abruptly. So it can actually make you a little irritable, maybe give you a headache. And so what I suggest in the eye is that you slowly integrate back into activity after the meditation is over. So that bliss from your meditation can more easily carry with you into your eyes open state. And that's where you really start to experience the benefits of meditation because you're able to have more of a background sense of contentment where, you know, you can, again, maybe be around somebody who really used to trigger you. Now you don't react the same anymore. And so the things in your life have less of the same negative emotional charge as they used to. So um, the book is Thrive. Did you do an audio book for this? There'll be an audio book coming out in a few months. But no, I haven't recorded one as of now. And if people heard this conversation and they're thinking, wow, I really want to learn more about George and his work, what's a good entry point to the ecos the George Spike Peterson ecosystem? Newsletter, book, podcast, Instagram. Yeah, all of that. Newsletter, book, newsletter, George's Daily Motivation Newsletter. You can find all of this on my website, georgespeterson.com. My podcast, Global Shift Podcast. Also, um, you can check out my trainings and my retreats on my website, as well as I have a 90-day coaching program that's coming up starting September 10th. I don't know if this will be out before then. But then uh, my book is really a great entry point. And then the book, too. We'll, for more information, we'll point you to my website. Beautiful, man. Well, it's an honor having you on and uh, hearing hearing the details of your story. I've heard little bits here and there, but to have it all come together has been beautiful. And I think it's going to be really inspirational for a lot of people out there, especially those who are potentially struggling with addiction or they know someone who's who's uh, struggling with addiction. So thanks again for being so open and so transparent with the telling of your story. And, uh, and it's an honor to call you a friend. And uh, as always, I look forward to connecting with you in person at some point, hopefully soon. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It was an honor. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.